Greg Meskel here with you once again. More USA Water Polo at home. And this week, as we've told you the last couple of days, our whole theme is about return to play. And I give the same preface before every one of these talks. We know that depending on where you're watching around the country, you are at a different level or phase of getting back to your favorite sport of water polo. So some of you might be already in the pool. You might not be watching this right now because you're practicing. You're getting a chance to pass and swim. We know others are still waiting to get back into the water. So we had that caveat here. We know that depending on where you are, as we've discussed earlier this week, certain decisions are being made. Please check with your local health officials, your facility managers, to determine what procedures are taking place in your area to find out when you can get back in the pool. But this whole week, it's about making sure that when you do get back in the water, you're doing so safely and in a healthy way. And we have the pleasure today, thanks again to our good friends at Hogue Orthopedic Institute, to be joined by Dr. Eugene Yim. Doctor, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, before we get started, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the areas of medicine that you work in. Sure, thank you, Greg, and thank you to U.S. Water Polo for hosting this event. My name is Dr. Eugene Yim. I am a primary care sports medicine physician at Hogue. I also serve as the head medical team physician for the Los Angeles Chargers. Also work with the U.S. men's and women's national volleyball teams. Excellent. That's uh, a lot of things, especially those in the Southern California area that they know well, the Chargers and USA Volleyball, and we're really appreciative of having you here with us today. I think the first thing we want to jump into, and we know that, you know, pardon the pun, people want to jump into the pool, but they want to make sure that they're doing it in the right way. Let's talk a little bit about pool, pool safety, in, and I know this is such a cliche, but this new normal has been such a phrase that everyone uses now. As you're thinking about athletes, people getting back in the pool, what are, what are some of the things people should be thinking about when you're talking pool safety these days? Well, one really important point to remember is that no pool is in isolation. Around every pool, you're going to have land, unless you're in a circumstance where you're jumping from your car, car right into a pool. Every pool is going to be surrounded by land that you're walking through, whether it's a public or a private place. Um, and also, it's important to remember that all swimmers usually come with an entourage. So uh, with, your, with your swimmers, you're going to have family, parents, friends, siblings, coaches as well. So there's important principles that, that you need to keep in mind as well with these kind of groups. Uh, but the point regarding the pool not being in isolation, you, you have to remember the basic tenets of hygiene around COVID-19 that I'm sure everyone has heard of time and time again. But these basic tenets are the first, the first things you have to remember because not just inside the pool, but outside the pool, you have to follow appropriate guidelines. And so simple principles like hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, making sure you're covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze, wearing the appropriate face covering when you're not in the water, staying home when you don't have to be at the pool. So limiting your entourage to those who really need to be there with you. Um, and then the social distancing as well, when you're outside of the pool and the perimeter of the areas, in the training facilities, in the bathroom areas, in the restaurants, parking lots, important to keep the six foot distance that's recommended by the CDC and all the basic principles of hygiene as well before you even jump into the pool. So that's important to remember. Yeah. You bring up a lot, of, a lot of great points there. And, and as we're talking here, if you're watching live on Facebook, don't forget you can add some questions in the comments section and we'll be sure to pass those along to Dr. Yim and uh, have him answer those as we work through this conversation. You mentioned some of those things that I think a lot of us that go to pools all the time, don't think about all those little steps, right? I'm getting out of my car, I'm going to walk near somebody, open the door, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's a lot to take in, um, but I think, and and I'm curious for your opinion on this as well. We say all this not to make people afraid to do these things, but just to make sure that they're making themselves as safe as possible. Absolutely. It's for your individual safety, but it's also looking out for others. Um, I think those of us who are healthy and who don't have a lot of comorbidities, we may think that we're less at risk, but the bottom line is you still are at risk. And importantly, you're also putting others at risk potentially as well. So being thoughtful, not only for your own health, but the health of others around you. 
during this time, we've seen so many folks share uh, photos of their backyard pools. And it seems like if you had a crystal ball and you knew to either put a pool in your backyard or buy a house with a pool, you were ahead of the game once pools closed around the country. But it's still important to make that facility uh, safe for all, whether you have neighbors coming over. I know I've read about people doing kind of like an Airbnb with their pools where they've where they've rented them out and let strangers come in and everything from Olympic athletes on down to bar their, their facilities in a time when they're not used to being a public facility, how can a homeowner make sure that their home pool area is a safe one? That's a great point, Greg. And uh, quite honestly, what we're seeing in the community is a lot of spread in those situations. Uh, there are groups of individuals gathering around personal pools since the public pools are closed. And with that, we've seen increased transmission through families and through those close encounters. I think the important principles that you would apply to having friends over into the house also apply to the pool. Just because it's a pool doesn't mean that you're not going to have a risk of exposure. There are some people who think because it's outside or there's water that there's uh, not the need to follow the same protocol that you would in having friends over inside your home. But the same principles are important to remember. If you don't wash your hands before you get into the pool, sure, there's water there, but there's a risk of you spreading the virus to others in the pool with you. Same with respiratory etiquette. If someone's sick in the pool and they're not covering their cough or their sneeze, they can pass that along to the individuals inside the pool. Face coverings are a challenging issue. In the water, the CDC does not recommend wearing face coverings, largely because they can get wet. And once face coverings become wet, it's hard to respirate through the face coverings. And so for safety reasons, that's not ideal. We've seen a lot of applications for the face shields or the masks as an alternative, which is reasonable because those are made of plastic materials that don't have to be breathable. But the point is to be safe. And I think that with these situations where homes are being opened up, to potential strangers or even to large groups of families, it is increasing the risk of exposure in those settings. You talked about uh, the different groups that might be in a home setting and, and people feeling like, well, maybe they're in the water, they're okay. But uh, to your point, when you go to someone's house, right, you might, you might encounter people of various ages, people that are more susceptible to, to illness, maybe an elderly person, someone immune suppressed. In your mind, why, why is it important to be aware of all the people that you might be coming in contact with at home aquatic use? Absolutely important. Um, with an exposure, you won't know who's at risk until afterward. Meaning if, if you are sick and you don't know it and you're out, every individual you're in contact with and close contact with has a risk of contracting COVID from, from you. And so from that perspective, you have to be mindful of the individuals you surround yourself with for their sake, as well as for yours. If there are certain individuals you know who might be in high risk situations where they have a lot of medical issues, they have diabetes, asthma, COPD, other conditions where if they were to contract the virus, they might become severely ill. Um, you might want to purposefully separate yourselves from those individuals for their own benefit. Likewise, if there's individuals you know who might be high risk of contracting the virus and bringing it into your home, you should be mindful of that. And so um, having some kind of screening protocol where you're asking individuals whether they've traveled from high risk areas, whether they've been in contact with other individuals who have, who have known positive tests for COVID, a symptom screens. So the same processes that a business would actually recommend as they're opening up a pool at your home, there should be a certain um, protocol for that to consider as well, just to mitigate the risk for your own family. We're talking with Dr. Eugene Yim here. And of course our focus with water polo is about getting back in the pool. But for the last three months, and, and even when you are in prime water polo uh, playing season, you're still doing what we'd call dry land workouts. You're running, maybe you're going to a gym. Um, I'm looking there in your shop behind you, I can see the volleyball and the Chargers helmet to land sports. I imagine a lot of the same protocols come to mind, but when you're doing those land workouts, whether it's 
using free weights or on a treadmill, the Peloton, those sorts of things, a lot of those same measures apply to keep everyone safe and healthy? That's correct. That's correct. And so you want to apply the same principles and be consistent with them, whether you're in the water, whether you're out in the snow, whether you're on land with exercise, infectious diseases don't, don't, don't discriminate. They'll still infect you. There is likely some differences with regards to exposure risk in those different settings. And there's some preliminary data about temperature, for example, and how that might affect the viability of the virus, but nothing is definitive. And until that's definitive, you would assume that these same principles should, should be applied for athletes across all different sports. We're talking with Dr. Yim here. And if you have a question, please leave it in the Facebook uh, comments here. And, and, and we did just get one come across. And I think there's still a lot to be learned here, but, but I'll ask it to you anyway, even though knowing that in this time we don't have all the answers, there is this question about can, can the virus live in water? Is, you know, is chlorine this great cure-all? What, what have you heard? What's, what's kind of moving in which direction as far as the consensus on that question? It appears the consensus at this point is that the virus will not be viable in water, especially with the treatments that are undergone with chemicals such as bromine or chlorine. So that's, at this point, the, the understanding that we have but again, I think you have the water, but you also have the air above it. And so you're not completely submerged, especially in a sport like water polo. So although the virus might not live in the water, um, you still have the air around, you still have the towels you're using, you still have your sweat and your own secretions that can travel a certain distance. So there's still the need for caution. I think those questions might be more um, applicable, at least in determining how the disinfection protocols through a pool, for example. So is there a need to do any special disinfection of the water if the virus were to live in it in between uh, workouts or in between groups coming into it? And the thought is that you don't need any special um, hygiene procedures for cleaning the water other than those that are already recommended for routine hygiene of pools. That's, and that's a really helpful topic, and I know we're going to touch on it later in the week as well with some of the other physicians that'll be joining us, but, but that was a question that came up a lot. There are so many aquatic athletes that have so many years of being in chlorine, they assume that must wipe out everything on earth, but you bring up the great point that it's not just about being in the water. You think about water polo, you're tying your cap, you're passing a ball, there's the frame of the goal. Again, not to you know, go to extremes, but there are a lot of surfaces and things that are, aren't submerged in chlorinated water to Dr. Yim's point. So just, just a thing to keep in mind there um, as, we, as we work through this. And as we're talking about all this, Dr. Yim, I, I think some people might say, well, yeah, there's so many rules and things, and do I even wanna leave my house anymore? Is it even fair to think I should go to a place I follow all the instructions, but, but should I be doing this? So when you think about all these recommendations, you're talking about following the guidelines, wearing your mask, should people still have a sense of, of uh, confidence, of comfort to be able to go out and do some of these things you're describing? That's a personal decision. Um, there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but there's also a lot of important information to understand. So I think there's a balance between being cautious, but also understand the re understanding the realities of um, the pandemic currently. It's a personal decision. I wouldn't blame anybody for wanting to just stay home during this period and play it safe. That is the safe approach. But at the same time, we all know that if you're not exercising, you're not healthy. And so there's a balance there if individuals can move some of their exercises into their home, that's certainly a reasonable short-term goal. But just the idea of not being able to have fresh air and enjoy nature and uh, to a certain extent to have some minimal interactions with other people, I can understand why people would be comfortable um, doing that, but doing that in a way that is measured and also informed by the realities of the pandemic. And a lot of that is geographic too. So the same danger level here in Orange County might be different from San Francisco in the middle of the city, which might be different from uh, a city in Ohio, for example. So there's a lot of discernment that goes into that. So you do want to lean a lot upon your local physicians, your local medical professionals, your local government. So whether it's your county 
health department as well as your state health department and the more refined recommendations they'll give based on the situation that's more relevant to you and your community. You know, as a, as a doctor that works in sports, I'm sure you've, you've had no shortage of athletes that are rehabbing from an injury and trying to work their way back onto the court or on the field. And I know in those circumstances, the athlete has to be in tune with their own body and, and know how they're feeling and, and really work hard at their rehab to get back out there in conjunction with what they're getting from a doctor, right? Maybe the feedback they're receiving, the exercises, the drills, that sort of thing. This, this feels a little bit similar. Like you want to find experts and listen to their advice, but you also have to be kind of an advocate for yourself and do what you feel is best for your own personal body, your own personal family. Exactly. You, you hit the nail right on the head. I think each individual has a responsibility to do their own research and to seek advice and to synthesize that and make the best decision for themselves. Um, so it's really important to do that. You can't rely on um, the opinion of others. You can't rely on the opinion of uh, a single media source, for example. So the more you can do to learn, the more you can do to actively seek those answers, the the more confident you can be that you're making the best decision for yourself. With all the uh, doctors we've talked to this week and, and, and we have some more great conversations tomorrow and Friday, I've always liked to ask the question, what are the questions you're getting? So what are the ones that people keep coming back to you with kind of the FAQ, if you will, are, are there some common things that we haven't hit on that you find yourself addressing once, twice, five times a day? It's a great question. Um, very commonly, I'll be asked, do I need to be tested um, if I'm traveling? Do I need to be tested if I have family visiting? Should I be tested just to see whether I have the virus? So a lot of questions around the utility of tests. And I think a lot of those questions come from the fact that there are a number of tests available and they have varying accuracy and they have varying um, reported utility. And so there's a lot of confusion around testing, whether it's important, whether it's critical, whether it's helpful. So a lot of misconceptions about what you gain from a test. So common question is, I'm planning to travel my, to, my, uh, to visit my folks out of state. Would you suggest that I get the nasal swab test to screen for COVID before I go? I have an elderly mother, she has asthma, and I'm scared that I'm carrying the virus and will, uh, she'll contract it. So there's two pieces to that question that are relevant. One, um, how, how common is it for people to be asymptomatic carriers, meaning they have the virus, but they're not exhibiting any symptoms? And number two, uh, what, what is the utility of testing someone like that for the sake of protecting another individual prior to, prior to um, travel? So the data about asymptomatic carriers is still unreliable um, at first. It was thought that uh, the preval prevalence rates of asymptomatic carriers were close to a quarter, 30%, um, and that they were viable um, vectors or uh, ways for individuals to spread the virus in the community. Uh, the, the opinion of that seems to be turning in the other direction now, where it appears that um, there may still be a, a decent number of carriers in the community, but they're not likely the way that the virus is being spread, as opposed to individuals who are actively feverish, having cough and respiratory symptoms, which are thought to be more of the peak of um, being infectious. The question about testing though, my, my typical answer for that is not to recommend it, mainly because even if we were to test an individual before they travel, they could still contract the virus while they're traveling, unfortunately. And traveling by plane is considered a higher risk, act, higher risk activity during a pandemic. And so because you have a negative test before you travel does not mean that the moment you get onto that plane, you contract the virus, you would never know you did, and you would still be exposing that individual that you're visiting to harm potentially. So that's one of the common questions I'll get around testing. Yeah, I can only imagine that, uh, you know, with with people reading, watching, uh, absorbing all this information daily, especially about testing numbers and all that sort of thing, that it becomes a question that you get a lot. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Eugene Yim here about uh, 
return to play as our theme this week and essentially how to do so safely. We've answered and asked a number of really, really good questions here so far. Don't forget, this will also be saved on demand on the USA Water Polo YouTube page. So if you missed this, you can go back and watch it right here on Facebook and then also again on YouTube as well. An another question that uh, came in here, and again, this is one that may be tough to um, get, get a firm answer on as we're still learning stuff, but it is a water polo community in regards to referees. So referees in water polo stand on the surface of the pool deck, looking down at the water, depending on the height of the player out of the water, they could be fairly well removed from the action. Should, should those folks be wearing masks as they're officiating matches? It's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I think I'd be very mindful of your state as well as local requirements for masking. And so I would definitely defer to that, at least in terms of policy, in terms of safety, um, an individual such as that would certainly be out of the six, six foot range in most cases in terms of proximity. So you would have at least the social distancing required to have a lower exposure to the players. Um, again, just as I said before, it's not a static picture where the players are in the pool the whole time and the referee is in a single spot. You're going to have spe spectators around the pool, potentially coaches coming up to the pool, giving instructions to the players. You're going to have that referee uh, walking to the bathroom occasionally. I assume they use the bathroom. <laughs> um, so because of all that, masking would be appropriate uh, for safety. But if the question is, uh, in that situation where the referee is standing, they're officiating the game, do they necessarily have to wear those masks? It's not necessarily, but for those other reasons, it would be a safer approach for them to wear. And, and that was a great breakdown. And I know water polo fans that are watching this are probably envisioning all the referees' movements. And for large parts of the game, yes, they'd be on the deck and the, and the action's happening beneath them. But if you think about nail checks before the game start to your point when they interact with coaches they go to the scorers table at halftime and after the game those are close proximity interactions and as we said at the top too we, we and we can't reiterate it enough as dr yim alluded to guidelines are going to come from your local area and so what what may be stated forth in this part of the country will be totally different in that part of the country and i, and I know you've seen it too dr yim you see it where just over county lines Someone lives here and five miles away. It's a totally different rule depending on where you're at, the concentration of people, how many cases. So there's so much that goes into it. Not to use another sports uh, analogy here, but this whole thing really does kind of harken back to teamwork and, and really everyone kind of working together. There really is, you hear that idea of responsibility, not only to yourself, but to others. Do you kind of find that? I know the medical field's built on teamwork with everything you do in the first place, but it seems to really be a focus here. Absolutely, absolutely. And it harkens back to the thoughts we had about a healthy individual having a pretty low risk of getting sick and having a problem for themselves. That with an infectious disease, and especially during a pandemic, all it takes is one sick person to affect a whole team. And it just takes that one weak link, unfortunately, to spread the virus to multiple people. And then you assume that those people have their own families that they interact with loved ones who might be older and sick, or even the younger kids who, who are susceptible as well, potentially, who might have asthma. So it's really being a part of the team, and not only for your own protection, but making sure that you're looking out for the health of everyone around you in your community and family. Talking with Dr. Yim here, talking about returning to play. We know that many people are at different stages of this around the country. Your area might be at a different phase of reopening. You were talking about looking at numbers and, and people watching things on the news. Is there an area that you consult regularly, uh, a public source, something people could feel comfortable with looking to? And we know it's, it's a moving target and it's changing all the time depending on where you live, but something that kind of um, is, a, is a good source for folks to get a, a sense of how things are trending? Absolutely. Well, at least in terms of resources, I would highly recommend any interested individual looking through CD, the cdc.gov webpage. So they have a page dedicated to COVID-19 under the subheadings. And for water polo in particular, I found a couple areas on that website that were helpful. It would be interesting for, or informative for people to be 
uh, to read up on. And if you go through the COVID-19 webpage, through the parks and recreational facilities, there's some recommendations about, about aqua aquatic venues. So a lot of information about the basic principles of hygiene, but also recommendations about face coverings, recommendations about pool safety as it relates to this. Um, so the CDC is a great uh, resource. Also helpful is what I saw on there that they have another link towards healthy swimming. So they have a whole uh, website with resources dedicated to healthy swimming. And it's not just uh, COVID-19 alone. And a very important point to remember through this pandemic is that just because COVID-19 is going on does not mean that all the other viruses and bacteria all of a sudden are going on vacation. Um, all the same viruses, the flu, gastroenteritis, pink eye, ear infections, all these things that typically occur throughout the year will continue to occur. And so it's important to maintain the appropriate protocols for those um, diseases as well, just to make sure that they're not unaddressed through this pandemic. Yeah, you bring up a great point. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get a break from flu season just because we're dealing with everything else that's going on or any other illness that, that, that typically comes along at a certain time of year. Appreciate all this information that you've been sharing. We're talking to a largely uh, sports-oriented community here in Water Polo, and, and as we start to wind things down here, if anyone has another question, we can, we can sneak one more in here to Dr. Yim, but appreciate his time. I know a lot of sports fans are, you know, and this is just more of a, a general question for you as someone who, who's involved with other, other sports and teams, that sort of thing. They're playing close attention to other sports that are going on right now. You hear a lot of talk about uh, leagues getting into bubbles to compete. There's talk about the NBA doing this, uh, women's professional soccer, Major League Baseball. Um, as we move towards that, I gather as someone who's in the medical field and is always interpreting new data, how, how beneficial will, will those, I don't want to call them experiments, but those return to plays be in kind of informing future protocols? Very helpful. And I think the idea of having a pod-based approach or a cohort approach is helpful for large groups and large teams. Um, and so that idea, just on a more basic level, is that you're going to have smaller groups within the larger group that are training together at first and having exposure to each other, much like you would have in a household. So at, at this point, if people are living in a home, you don't have to socially distance necessarily because you're constantly um, exposed to each other. So similarly, as things progress through the pandemic as sports return, if you have these smaller pods within larger groups where uh, athletes will train and are training with those individuals for a set period of time, um, it, it would first of all help if there's a potential outbreak. So if you have one individual in that pod that is sick, they've only exposed that pod as opposed to the whole team. And so that's a concept that's occurred with uh, some sports um, already in the professional level and certainly would make sense larger scale in the community as well with every sport. Excellent. Well, as we, as we close things out here, just want to ask if there's any final thoughts, anything you'd would like to leave people with here, you know, if there was, there was one thing they took away or a couple of things, and I feel like part of it is, please, you know, wash your hands, social distance, wear your mask, but is there, is there any bullet points you'd want to leave folks with? Well, I'd say it's an interesting time for everybody. It's uh, a lot has happened in 2020 and the COVID-19 is just one of the, the many things that have happened this year that no one was prepared for. But I think that's where um, intellectual curiosity is important. So just making sure that everybody engages in the research that's going on with this, all the publications that are being made, all the new findings that are coming out and each person just taking that initiative to really uh, ask the good questions that um, are important in terms of their safety and their health and making sure they take ownership of that rather than um, assuming what they hear is true. Excellent. Dr. Yim, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us here today. Some really insightful details and information that I'm sure will help a lot of folks. Great. It was my pleasure, Greg.